gifts in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Do any of you still write letters? Like with your hands and a pen and paper and not a computer? Okay. Long letters? Regularly. That's fantastic. What's wrong with the rest of you? Hmm. Um, Paul has been writing this letter. So if you like look through Romans, um, this Bible I have is really small print. The large print that I had is falling apart. Um, it's actually, if any of you remember Andrew Wilson, he stepped on it a long time ago, and that's why it broke the binding. So let him know I'm still upset about it. Uh, but small print's hard to read. But imagine writing out all these pages of Romans... How, like, that's a long letter. Any of you write letters that long on a regular basis? Yeah, me either. I have trouble responding to emails with the, sure, that sounds good. (laughs) Paul has been writing to these Romans for a while now, writing this out, telling them all these things that we've covered, all the stuff we've talked about for, you know, since like August. He steps back now, and here at this break in the letter, he reiterates, and he, he states very plainly that what he's been telling them for several chapters, that they are messed up. They've got, like, action-packed with issues. And he tries to explain to them that he's so upset by this that he literally and physically is in pain because of it. And Paul, Paul's pretty serious about his faith. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about um, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews, 39 lashes, Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, and on and on and on and on, all because he's so serious about his faith. And then in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, he says something along the lines of, oh wait, I turned right to it, uh, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So all of this stuff had happened to him, and he still says, hey, I've got I've to preach to you, I've got to tell you what God's got to say to you. He wanted to make sure that they knew he wasn't making this stuff up. He started right there in chapter 1 of this. He says, I'm telling the truth. All right, so that's, I mean, he wants them to know that this is going, he's not making this stuff. He wasn't just being a jerk about things. And he knew what had happened in their history. If you remember Paul's background, he was trained. He knew Israelite history. He knew the old te- what we call the Old Testament really well. So he knew the things that they had done. He knew the promises they had. He knew how they had gone up and down, good and bad, good and bad, 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 a little bit of good, bad, 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 and knew all of that about them very well. He had already used some strong language earlier in this letter. In Romans chapter 2, it says, because of your hard and impertinent heart. And then down in verse 21, he says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. So he's, he's pretty firm in this letter. He's not being all nice, like, you know what, guys? A for effort. Jesus loves you. Do what you do. You know, be you. It's all good. God's got this. He's coming down on him pretty hard. 15 to 20 years before this letter to the church in Rome, he's writing to Thessalonica, Uh, where we get Thessalonians, and he says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. He's being pretty firm. He goes on to say in the passage that he wishes, because they're so messed up and they just don't get it and they aren't coming around, that he could just take their spot. He wishes he could just be cut off from Christ in their place. Well, if you remember back in in whenever it was that we sat in here last and talked in chapter 8 of Romans, he had just told them that that's virtually impossible. He says, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. His willingness to step in like that, he wants to protect his boys and that includes the girls. It reminds us of Moses back in Exodus when he says, if you will forgive their sin to God, but if not, please blot me out of your book. Moses said, God, we're messed up already. 
just take it out on me. They didn't, they didn't know. Just let them go and just come get me, God. And, and it might remind you that kind of step in and take the blame for someone might remind you of another character in the Bible that you've heard of a time or two named Jesus. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then later he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why would people like Israel that are so privileged, they were given all this stuff for no reason other than God chose to do it. Why would they reject those blessings? Paul wanted the church in Rome to know that the gospel is the good news from God that they'd heard about all this time in all their history. They were very familiar with these covenants and promises and what was supposed to be coming, and here it was, and Paul wanted them to know that. Paul didn't preach a be-yourself message. There was no you're good just the way you are lesson. Don't get me wrong, you are special. There you go. You are special, and God loves you enough to send his son to die for you, but God loves you so much that he wants more from you. He wants you, you may be rocking life out and doing awesome, but God still wants you to do a better job, okay? Not that he's like picking on you and coming down on you really hard, but God knows what you're capable of, and you're capable of doing better. You're capable of following him closer, pursuing him more fanatically, I guess. I don't know a good word. It escaped me. Don't settle for finding your identity in sin. Don't proclaim, I'm a sinner, woe is me, because that's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ, Don't just be a sinful person because we are God's people and we should live like we have his promise. All right, the Israelites are God's people and they didn't do a good job of living like they have that promise. They boasted of his promises, but they didn't live like they have his promises. We are God's people and we should live like we have that promise. There's a story that Jesus told uh, in Matthew chapter 25. If you want to follow along, it's verses 14 through 30 or if you're on social media, version is up, and I'm pretty sure this passage is on there. So version, it's not up. Can I blame Nicholas even though I did it tonight? Super. Dang it, Nicholas. So I'll read it to you, or you can, um, back in the day, we had these books that we carried around with us that had the scriptures on them. Some of you have these phones. Anyway, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours." But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents, for to everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds really harsh. In our passage, Paul lists nine advantages, nine things that Israel was given. So they were essentially given these nine talents, if you will, to his brethren, to Paul's countrymen, the Jews that have originally, they were set apart by these things that God gave them, by these things that God did for them. This is what made them so much above everyone else because God gave them these things. Let's look quickly. They're Israelites, okay? Do you remember the story of Jacob wrestling with God? If you don't, Jacob wrestled with God, and he refused to let go until God blessed him. And God did that. He changed his name to Israel, and on and on and on. And you can guess, name changed to Israel. Surprisingly enough, he had 12 sons-ish, and they became the nation of Israel. 
There's a lot of stuff in the Bible we don't talk about with young people. Also, they had the adoption as God's firstborn. Okay, the firstborn male, and this isn't just an Old Testament thing. This is something that we can see in our recent past. The oldest male gets the inheritance, right? Uh, I'm the oldest male in my family. My older sister, we don't have an inheritance, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> in Isaiah 51.1, it says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Israel knew where they came from. They were God's adopted. They were his first one. They had that inheritance. Jesus is God's son. He is God in the flesh. He is the Savior who was promised and who died and rose again and will return. And through the sacrifice of Jesus, this inheritance was opened. New achievement unlocked. Let's talk theory for a second. Okay, let's say I have an infinite amount of something. In my mind, it's coffee. So let's go... I approve of your noise for that moment. Uh, I want to give some of my coffee to Philip. Yes, yes. So if I have an infinite amount of coffee and I split it with Philip, how much coffee do I have left? Okay, but it's still infinite. Because can infinite really be smaller? Don't break my head. There's no lines and things, just infinite. So if I divide infinite into two, we both have infinite. In Bible college, they have college algebra. That's it. Done. Okay, so going with that premise that infinite divided in two is infinite and infinite, because, come on. What if Philip wants to split his infinite amount of coffee with someone else? Let's say Dane decides that he wants to be a man and drink coffee. So on and on and on it goes, and everyone is happy to share their coffee because no matter how much you divide infinite coffee, you still have infinite coffee because that's what I said. <laughs> Let's shift that to eternity because it makes sense. If you have eternity, and that's the gift that God gave you, okay, you can keep it for yourself and decide that Philip doesn't need to go to heaven. You can go to hell. This just got real. I mean, there's two alternatives. Come on. It's heaven or hell. There's no in-between. I want to share eternity with Philip, okay? So I'm going to share that eternity with Philip. I still have my full eternity, okay? It doesn't hurt anything we have that God gave us to give that to the people around us. So why do we take the things, the gifts, the talents that God gave us and hide them, dig in the ground, forget where we put them? Why do we hold them to ourselves when we've got that gift that we can hand right over and share eternity and infinite coffee with Philip forever, or whoever else you have around you. Um, also, God's glory rests on them. Uh, there's a verse in Revelation that talks about, you know, heaven doesn't need the sun because God's glory fills, and you can see everything because it's so awesome. There are stories back in the Old Testament where God's glory, when they had the, the tabernacle, he came down and rested on it, and, and the smoke and the fire, and that's how God's glory is imagined, just this fire, this brightness, sometimes in a cloud. And that's uh, Israel is set apart. God's very presence is with them. He, he dwelt near them up on the mountain. That's where Moses went to get the law. Uh, Israel has God's God's covenant, and there's a lot of verses in the Old Testament about covenant that talk about that. Um, God gave them the law directly with his own hand. He wrote it down for them, then Moses smashed it, and God gave it back to them. Uh, but then he actually followed that up with grace uh, through Jesus, through Israel. The object and character of their true worship is the next thing he says, and that's the grace that God gives them through Jesus who came through the Jews. They got the promises of God. The history of Israel that leads up to Christ, who is through Jew Jewish lineage, that's all these gifts that God gave Israel. The last line of this passage closes with the proclamation of the deity of Christ. And this is the stuff right here. From whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall the eternally blessed God. Why then were the Jews so special? Because of the reasons that we've just talked about. These are the same reasons they were set apart from everyone back in the day, that God put them above, that they were so successful because God said so and he's God. But these are also the same reasons that they failed so epically. They had these gifts, and they just forgot about it. They buried them in the ground and tried to say, here, God, here's what's yours. And God's like, you wicked servant. Why are we so special? 
Because I told you earlier, you're special. Well, why are you special? How about the person next to you? Go ahead, look. Why are they special? Well, because God says so. Because you may not like the person next to you. I'm causing problems for some people. But God died (laughs) for that person the same as he died for you. Although this letter was written to the Church of Rome, I think we wouldn't be penalized for reading Paul's introduction in in Romans chapter 1 as to those who are loved by God, not those in Rome who are loved by God, but to those who are loved by God and called to be saints because that is you. You are loved by God. You are called to be saints. You have this gift. In that parable of the talents, what are you going to do with what God's given you? Are you going to go and, and multiply it? Disciples making disciples? Israel got to this point where they were so far removed from what God had given them all those years ago that they killed his son who was sent to save them from the path they set themselves on. They were offered so much and they were given such a privilege, but they took what they were given. They wrapped it up. They dug a little hole somewhere by a tree and they buried it. And they didn't even remember where it was when he came back to collect. And they're just like, I don't know you. What do you have and what are you going to do with it? I'll make this easy. You are included as an adopted heir, okay? You are an heir to the kingdom of heaven. God is offering this to you with all the rights and responsibilities. If you've accepted Christ and you are seeking to follow him as Savior, then do something with that. All right, follow his example. Jesus didn't come to earth and sit quietly in the corner laughing at how stupid we are. Don't just bury it so nothing happens. Take your promised eternity and share it. Take God's infinite love. Take God's eternity that he's given to you and make sure others have a portion of that. We are God's people and we should live like we have his promise. And so that's our challenge. We won't worry about five years from now, 10 years from now, any time from now, we'll worry about now. You are an heir to the kingdom of God. We are God's people We need to do everything we can to live like we have that promise. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the way that you care for us. Thank you for the way you provide for us. Thank you so much for a chance to come together as a body of believers from uh, across the United States and beyond this evening, God, that we can come and worship you, that we can come together and sing praises to you and and look into the scriptures and, and see lessons we can learn. And I pray that we would be encouraged to do a better job uh, of following you, God, and to do a better job of taking the gift that, you give, that you've given us, God, and multiplying that and sharing it with those around us, Lord. I thank you so much for your sacrifice of your son, and it's in his precious name that I pray. Amen.